Thank you so much for coming today and getting through that traffic to get here. I really appreciate that and validate you for that. So this is a, really my favorite topic to talk about. I have done this presentation hundreds of times and every time I do, I still do it with the same amount of enthusiasm, which you know, amazes me. So uh, I study high risk behavior for a living, particularly how it affects the brain as it's growing and developing. And so what we'll do today is I'll talk a little bit about brain development and give you kind of the foundation that, uh, for, for that particular issue for neurodevelopment. Then we'll talk about how addiction happens to the brain. And then we'll talk about specific types of substances and behaviors that have different effects on the brain. And then the last thing we'll do is talk about prevention tools of what parents and uh, educators and clinicians can do to arm their clients and students and parents to prevent these things. So I get asked this question quite a lot. Um, is it really so harmful? So let me ask you guys, do you think more students or parents ask me this question? Everyone always says that except students because students <laughs> know, right? Uh, parents actually is the, the answer to that. And so uh, it's interesting because I'll have a parent say, well, you know, I drank in high school and I think I'm okay. Or I smoked weed in college and I'm fine now. Is it really that bad? And I'm scared that if I prohibit that use in my child, that they'll cr go crazy when they get to high school or college. So let me share with you how I answer this question. 90% of adult addicts begin engaging in that substance use or that behavioral issue under the age of 18. There's something amazing that's happening in our brain that when is it, it is exposed to high risk behavior has a really deleterious effect on the scaffolding process that is supposed to occur thereafter. Now we actually know that the younger that someone begins, the worse off they are. And this is a percentage risk that is actually added on to the genetic risk, which we can talk about more later. The good news is that the converse of this is true. So the longer that someone waits to engage in substance use, the less risk, as a matter of fact, almost completely ameliorating your risk of struggling with an addiction as an adult if you just wait. So I wondered, why is this? You know, what's happening here that this graph has a very specific decreasing um, uh, line? And the reason is because, of course, of this adolescent brain development, specifically that occurs between the ages of 11 and 25. So what I learned about the brain is that between about age zero and six, we're growing 200 billion neurons, way too many neurons. Our brain is not gonna use all of those, but it's like we get this big chunk of clay that will be set aside later for sculpting. Between about age seven and 11, our brain growth slows down a little bit, allows our bodies to catch up, and then we hit puberty around 11, 12, which kicks in one last growth process of the brain. That growth process though is interesting because we end up losing 50% of our cells during this time span. We end up here with 100 billion neurons left over. So starting off with 200 and leaving with 100 billion. But what's happening is we're growing two substances. The first substance is myelin. So this is a huge picture of a neuron, a brain cell. And you can see that we have this really wonderful fatty tissue that covers the axon of a neuron. This begins to thicken at about age 11, 12 and continuing that thickening process up until 24, 25. The thicker your myelin, the faster processor you will be. Now, you guys all know, I think everybody in here is over the age of 25, I think. We know that our processing speed peaks at the age of 25, and then unfortunately, slowly downhill from there. So we want our children to peak in processing speed. They will be the fastest, most efficient processors by the time they're 25. 
The second thing that's growing are these things right here that reach out called dendrites. Now dendrites actually reach out to other cells and the longer the strings of connections that we have equals the learning that's taking place. We are growing billions of neuronal connections between the ages of 11 and 25. Now the good news is that we grow these dendrites <clears throat> for the rest of our lives. Every time we learn something, we grow more, de more dendrites. But after the age of 25, we grow them so much more slowly. Between the ages of 11 and 25, our brain is at peak plasticity, which is the flexibility and rate of growth of our brain, right? And so we want this particular age to be very well protected so that these two things grow to their fullest extension. Now, this is a picture of a little infant neuron. And this is a great example of how this process happens. You can see that as this infant grows up to about 18 months, how the cells are already beginning to thicken and how those dendrites are proliferating and growing out. I love it when kids see this slide because they all go, ooh, gross. And I always say, oh no, this is not gross. This is really what you want in your brain. You want long strings of neuronal connections because the longer strings you have, the more skills you have. <laughs> so this is my favorite picture of all time. This was taken by Jay Geed back in the uh, late 90s when functional MRI technology started becoming um, so much less expensive. And he took pictures of an adolescent as they were growing through adulthood. So we can see where this growth is taking place. Now you all probably notice that it is very localized to the front part of the brain. Right here behind the forehead and about halfway up the skull, that's known as our prefrontal cortex and frontal lobes. And so you can see that we do have a frontal lobe when we're younger. It's just really primitive and immature, which is cool because we rely on our parents' frontal lobes anyway. But then, starting at about age 11, 12, that thickening process happens. So we have tons of neurons, but now the thickening process, the myelin is growing, those dendrites are proliferating like crazy. But what you'll notice here is that the darker the color, the less gray matter. And so gray matter is actually that cell body, right? And so whereas white matter, I always think of it as the connectors. And so if we're losing gray matter, that means we're actually losing cells, which is exactly what's happening. We're getting rid of about 50% of them in order to make room for that substance. And it's all based upon this principle, the principle of use it or lose it, exactly. Now, the good news here is this principle stays active for the rest of our lives. Those of you guys who may do research or treat um, older populations know this, right? The longer we keep that juice, those electrical activity and the blood flow running down strings of neurons, the longer those neurons will stay active and keep growing dendrites. When we stop using those strings, the neuronal tissue actually atrophies and in some cases actually um, dies off. And we may have things that look like amyloid plaques or other problems. But for our purpose today, the use it or lose it principle is critical because the prefrontal cortex governs executive functioning skills. Now, there are other executive functioning skills that come online in elementary. But these are the ones that really start to come online at about age 11, 12. And they're critical for us growing up and being a fully functioning adult. Now what you see is that we move from very concrete black and white thinking of childhood into abstract conceptual understanding. This is a beautiful, fun time, not so much for parents, because this is when kids really learn how to argue. And so when I hear people come to me and say, oh my God, they're so oppositional. Like they're just overnight, they're arguing and they're being contrary. And what I have to say about that is, oh good, they're developing right on time. And the parent's like, what, you know? And there's a certain way and language of talking, because you don't have to argue with them, right? But a lot of times we do, we get into power struggles. And so what that does is that just reinforces more arguing. 
But it's really a beautiful time because we are able to move from very concrete thinking and to understand abstract thoughts, things we couldn't see, feel, or touch before. And if you, know, if you ever ask um, a, a young person what religion means to them, you know, if they're under the age of 10, they usually will say something very concrete, you know, like maybe, I pray to Jesus, something like that. But then if you ask a 16-year-old what that means, then they will be able to tell you uh, abstract ideas like faith and love and service and colors and feelings and behavior. I mean, it really flowers into a beautiful um, meaning. Our ability to control our impulses really comes online because this is the part of the brain that scientists say gives us top-down control on our limbic system. It's the part that puts on the brakes to everything. Our prefrontal cortex does complex problem solving and decision making. If you think about when you're little, you just pretty much rely on mom and dad, right? Can I do this? Can I not? Yes or no? But when you grow, you have to learn how to brainstorm, evaluate outcomes, choose and try different solutions, and that all will culminate in us becoming more complex decision makers, which really results in what our judgment looks like. And then these guys, emotion regulation and frustration tolerance, we're not supposed to grow up and continue to have temper tantrums, right? Although I know I'm guilty of that sometimes still, but this gives us the ability to calm ourselves down, regulate and handle frustrations of uh, adulthood. And if you guys are thinking potentially about some of the clients that you work with that have emotion regulation skills, a lot of it may be because they're limbic a lot and they're not having as much access to their prefrontal cortex. Now, this one right there, the ability to feel empathy, to me, that's one of the most important ones. If you don't get some of the other ones, but you get empathy, you probably will still be okay. What do we call people in our culture who can't or won't feel empathy? And where do we hope they go? Far away from us, right? <laughs> we do. At prison, I heard that, right? We, we keep them uh, cordoned off, hopefully, because they hurt people. But you guys think about this. Empathy requires another one of these skills to come online. Which one is that? Can you guess? This one right there at the top, abstract conceptual understanding. Empathy is the ability to step inside somebody else's shoes, even if you've never gone through what they're going through. You can imagine through your abstract reasoning skills what that might be like and how it, they might be thinking and feeling in that moment. Uh, Meniger calls that mentalizing, right? And we know that is a frontal lobe skill. And so sometimes it's very difficult to teach empathy, uh, other than a, a very rote behavioral teaching, young, because really you need your frontal lobe to start coming online in order to do that. And this is why I think it should be part of our acumen as parents, to make sure that we teach appropriate empathy, especially as that frontal lobe is growing and developing it. Aside too, there are some really neat studies about the frontal lobe. And they did a, a really cool functional MRI study of people who were devoutly religious while they were praying. The frontal lobe lit up like a Christmas tree. The same study was done on women while they were looking at pictures of their brand new infant babies. Guess what part of the brain lights up? Right here, frontal lobe. Some of the same studies show that with our pets as well. It's beautiful research done. This is the part of the brain that connects us to people, to our higher power, and to all of these skills. Critical part to keep on and working. Okay. So let's move into talking about addiction and how engaging in high-risk behavior or substance use affects that part of the brain while it's growing and developing. And so in order to do so, we have to focus on another part of the brain, which I've already mentioned, the limbic system. So this is my favorite picture right here, this 3D image. My husband thinks that I'm really geeky because that's one of my favorite pictures. But it's such a cool picture, isn't it, of the limbic system, and it shows you all the little teeny tiny organs. They're so small that scientists call them organelles that are all connected together. 
to create our fight or flight system. But a lot of people don't realize still that this is where all pleasurable experiences begin and end in the limbic system. And so we have um, a, a really beautiful part of the brain here that we're gonna focus on the pleasure experience of this. I think a lot of you guys probably know how fear and anger turn on the limbic system and the fight or flight, but we're just gonna focus on the pleasurable experiences. In order to do so, we have to talk about the neurochemical dopamine. Now I want you all to, to know that there are many chemicals, of course, that regulate mood. So serotonin is probably one of the more popular ones, norepinephrine, your body's natural opiates, endorphins and enkephalins. There's another one called GABA, that those are all included in this process. But when we're talking about reward, they all terminate in dopamine. And so that's what we'll focus on today. Now, dopamine is the neurotransmitter that your body makes to signal when you're doing something good for your survival. So if there's something good in your environment for your survival, then it is salient. And so that salience registers in your limbic system and you get a little increase of dopamine that tells you that, which causes you to feel calm and happy. It really gives us this kind of the sense of well-being. Okay, so if you haven't, uh, oops, that last one shouldn't be up yet, but if you, um, haven't eaten for about four, five, six hours. How do you feel? Hangry, Hangry right? Mm-hmm. It's interesting to me that when you get hungry, your dopamine levels drop, and what happens is that your uh, limbic system is saying, hey, you need to go do something good for my survival, and until you do, I'm gonna make you feel really uncomfortable. And then as soon as you eat, you get a 100% increase in dopamine. So your limbic system says, hey, you just did a good thing for my survival. Here's your reward. Feel calm and happy for the next four hours. Now there's another human behavior that we engage in when we're married and protected, right? I can't believe y'all didn't laugh at that. (laughs) I work at a lot of schools, so they make me say that a lot. When human beings engage in sexual behavior, we get a dopamine increase of 150%. Now basically your limbic system is saying, hey, this is really good for your survival and your species survival. If somebody were to use a line of cocaine, maybe about this big, they would get a dopamine increase of about 350%. And as you can see, methamphetamine is 1100% increase in dopamine. I learned that heroin increases dopamine levels by 1300%. I couldn't even put it on this chart because you wouldn't be able to even see food or sex anymore. (laughs) But if you think about it, that kind of represents what happens. If you've ever known someone who became addicted to opioids or heroin, what's one of the first things they stop doing? Eating and having relationships with people. The brain, specifically the limbic system, simply gets hijacked. So here's what we think happens. Our brain has a hedonic threshold. Uh, That word means pleasure. And here it is. We are not supposed to go above that threshold. We go up and down within that threshold all day long. uh, You get hungry, your dopamine plummets, you eat, it goes back up. Maybe you get bored, lonely, dopamine plummets, go to the gym, call a friend, uh, uh, go to dinner with a friend, right? All kinds of things that we do that are good for our survival. And it's just this feedback loop that your limbic system is keeping you on target with. But here's what scientists believe happens when we spike our dopamine levels above that line. Two things. One, scientists believe that we start to damage the receptors that are already there. So there's less dopamine in the synapse. And two, scientists believe that learning takes place. You flood those synapses with so much dopamine that the brain says, oh, I better grow new dendrites. So I have more and more and more and more receptor sites for dopamine. So your brain simply learns. 
It's not learning the right thing, but it's learning because it's being hijacked. And so then what happens is all that dopamine leaves the system, and now you have all these new and damaged receptor sites, and what are they doing? Craving, screaming out for that thing it thinks it needs to survive. Now you guys, this is new brain structure. This is brain damage that can't be undone and new structure that can't just be undone. This is why we have a saying, once an addict, always an addict. You can't change that structure once it happens. And you know, it's interesting because the frontal lobe is the thinker, but the limbic system is just the reactor. It does a simple calculation. It says, hey, whenever you put this in my body, I get 250% more dopamine than when you put this in my body. So that must mean this is 250% better for my survival than this. It simply gets hijacked into thinking, oh, I need that to survive more. Now, this is the hedonic threshold for most people. But about one in every five, one in every six of us has a genetic predisposition for addiction. And if that's you, then this may be your hedonic threshold. It is lower. So I have studied a syndrome called the reward deficiency syndrome. And what they have postulated is that there are certain genetic polymorphisms that change the way we create and store and transmit neurotransmitters like dopamine. And that for people who have those genetic polymorphisms, that we actually make, store, or express a little less dopamine than everybody else from birth. And so if, if dopamine is the neurotransmitter that creates the sense of well-being, but yet from birth you don't make enough of it, how do you think that might affect someone as they were growing up? It creates restlessness, irritability, low self-esteem, things that you hear addicts and alcoholics share and have a common bond with. And they will tell you, man, as soon as I drank or as soon as I used, I felt normal. And that's exactly what's going on, normality. I wanna share a story with you that really illustrates this and helps kind of teach it. You can share this story. I've gained permission from the person who told it to me, who's an adult now. But I met this girl when she was 16 and she came to my office and she said, hey, you're the brain lady. You came to my middle school a few years ago and you did this presentation about high-risk behavior. It was so good, I quit smoking pot for like a whole month. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's great. But then what happened? She said, well, you know, my grandparents are older and they have custody over me. And when I got to high school, they didn't monitor me very well. And so I started hanging around with kids who used, but check this out. Me and my BFF created a safety plan. When uh, we would go to parties, I would drink this much in my red Solo cup and she would drink this much. If she took one pill, I'd take one pill. If she took one hit, I would take one hit. Now remember you guys, she's 16. She's got about 50% of her frontal lobe. So this plan kind of 50% makes sense. And I said, okay, how's this working for you? And she said, oh, well, I'm here, aren't I? Touche, okay. She said, to be honest with you, my best friend sometimes will get sick and not want to drink more, so I'll sneak some behind her back. Or sometimes she just doesn't want to, and I'm just baffled by that because it's so much fun. And so I will go out without her. And sometimes she'll get sick and stop, and I'll keep going. So what's my first question for her, you guys? Do you have any genetics in your family anywhere? And she says, oh, well, yeah, my parents are addicts and alcoholics, which is why I live with my grandparents. So it's pretty obvious to me that this beautiful young lady's threshold is this red line, whereas it sounds like her best friend's hedonic threshold is that black line. 
And even if they drink or use the exact same amount, all this young lady has to do is spike dopamine levels to that red line and her brain will start making those structural changes sooner. That's how the genetics work. And from what I've read, if you have the genetics on one side of your family, you're between 30 to 50% greater likelihood of struggling with an addiction. If you have it on both sides, your risk can go all the way up to about 75%. And then if you add your percentage, if you start younger, the percentage chance of becoming an addict and struggling with addictions as an adult is really high. I love this graph. It's my favorite one because it can show everybody how anybody can get addicted to anything if you spike your dopamine levels higher. But it also explains how people who have the genetic risk fare worse. Okay, so this is what it looks like on the brain. So this is a functional MRI, a slice of the brain looking this way. And we're looking from the top down here. And what you see is a picture of, on the top of someone who could be completely sober. You'll see that there's blood flow and electrical activity all over the brain working well together. Now the bottom represents a person who has been binge drinking or using drugs, in interestingly enough, who is also in fear. Brain looks the same in all of those examples. Now what you'll notice is right here, the limbic system is full of dopamine. The brain is saying, hey, I'm gonna keep you alive for the next four, five, eight hours, right? You don't need the prefrontal cortex, which really shuts off. So let me give you all a real life example that you might be able to relate to. Does anybody in here overeat on Thanksgiving? <laughs> oh, look at this. Nobody rose their hand. Oh, thank you for being honest. Okay, thanks. Okay, what do you feel like doing after you overeat on Thanksgiving? napping, watching football, right? You don't feel like doing complex problem solving and decision making. You don't feel like doing, uh, having a really intense empathic conversation with someone because this is what your brain looks like on Thanksgiving. Full of dopamine. Oh, I'm gonna keep you alive for the next like eight hours. You ate so much. And it shuts off your prefrontal cortex, which really makes sense because you don't really need it anymore. It did its job helping you to figure out how to keep yourself alive for the next four, five, six, eight hours. And now it can relax. And that's totally fine for us to do that to ourselves once in a while, and it's kind of what happens all day in varying degrees. But what if you are in between the ages of 11 and 25, and you are doing this to your brain a lot, frequently? If the frontal lobe is off while it's trying to grow, does it get to grow? And we call that arrested development. We know that if somebody starts using here at about age 12 and they keep going all the way up until about age 20, their frontal lobe growth will not look like that. It may look something more like this, or it may even look like this if they were really regular, maybe daily or every other day users. Now you guys are probably seeing the danger of this. If that continues on until they're 25 years old, whatever development they have in there at 25 is their peak. Processing speed, executive functioning skills, and interestingly enough, your total IQ score all peak at the age of 25. And if they don't peak here, but they peak here, that's what that kiddo has to work with for the rest of their lives. This is why I think ethically, if you work with people who have addictions, you've got to assess their executive functioning skills. Because if you just take away the addiction and send them back out into the world, when they have a rest in those functions, they're gonna relapse quickly. You've got to assess and treat those very basic skills. That's why things like DBT skills group or mindfulness groups are really helpful to add to the regimen for substance use treatment. Okay, so it takes time to heal. This is why I spend a lot of time working with youth 
because I really want to see this happen and you can watch it happen with adolescents. I used to have the um, honor of working at a residential treatment center here in Houston who housed kids for six to nine months. Can you believe that? And you could actually see the frontal lobe growth kick in once it got stabilized. And it was just amazing to watch. But I want you to see, this is a brain of a cocaine abuser 10 days sober. This brain is still in detox, screaming out for that thing that it thinks it needs to survive. And the same brain, 100 days sober, that's over three months. And you can see that the prefrontal cortex is only about 50% back on. It will take up to a year to a year and a half for this person to return to this level of brain activity. And if it's a heroin or opioid addict, it could take up to four to five years. Can you imagine how difficult it is to live life on life's terms when your brain is not completely on and functioning, even with no drug or addiction? So we know that there are so many different chemicals out there in the world that can spike dopamine levels. Let's talk about a few of them. So we know that alcohol has a half-life of about 48 to 72 hours, which means that even if you're not intoxicated, your liver is still trying to process this alcohol out of your system. And so what if we have a child who uses every single weekend three days a week, thereabouts, which is what this young man reported to do. If they start young as well, what's happening is that even though they're not intoxicated, it's still inside the system arresting development, right, every two to three days. And then maybe he stops drinking on Sunday, it's out of his system by Wednesday, but on Thursday or Friday he's drinking again. His poor brain never has a chance to stabilize and turn back on. And you can see the differences in these two pictures. Not only with electrical activity, this kiddo has a lot less, but also look at the brain growth, or I should say, the lack of. When the brain starts to specialize and grow, you can see that those um, uh, creases start to increase, right? As the neuronal connections start to proliferate. Just not happening for this kiddo. And then there's this particular drug, which back in 1969, if you had taken a marijuana seed and planted it in the ground, organically grown, and tested it, it would have had probably about two to three percent THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, which is the active ingredient in marijuana that we know is addictive. Now, it started to be genetically modified in the 70s. Today, in Houston, last year, 2017, I went to a DEA conference where they announced that the amount of THC in our local confiscated marijuana is between 17 and 26 percent here in Houston. It's genetically being modified to be more addictive so that you'll use more of it. And here's the scary thing to me. Its half-life is one to two weeks and if you are a moderate user, three to four weeks. If you're a daily user, up to six weeks that it's still in your system. In many ways, marijuana is a more dangerous drug to adolescent brain development than alcohol. And of course, a lot of kids use them both together. This brain scan is actually a SPECT scan. So it shows you brain connectivity. And so in a healthy, well-connected brain, what you'll see is a nice smooth scan. Everything's really well connected. Now these two kiddos who've been using marijuana on a very regular basis, you can see that it almost looks like holes. It's really not actually holes. It's areas that didn't get connected. It just didn't grow the way it should have because of lack of using use it or lose it, especially notable in these areas up here, the prefrontal cortex and the frontal lobes. And if these guys keep going up until the age of 25, their brain should have looked like this 
but it will maintain looking like that. Their executive functioning skills will be much, much lower. They will have a more difficult time. And then we've got these new things on the market. Have you guys seen e-cigarettes, electronic cigarettes? We know that nicotine is the most addictive substance on the face of the earth. Interestingly enough, it does not cause intoxication. But it increases over five different of your body's hormones, neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, adrenaline, enkephalins, endorphins, dopamine. It does so within eight seconds of it entering your bloodstream, which creates a highly potent an addictive substance. And so then we have this new thing, e-liquid. I learned that e-cigarettes were actually created in 2003 by a man named Han Lick, whose dad died of lung cancer. So he wanted to create something that was a safer way of ingesting nicotine. And so he's the one who created the, the contraption of an e-cigarette and uh, e-liquid. And so I've looked, there's not tons of research yet. It's really only been out for a few years. There's a lot of published studies in England and I wanna share with you guys some of what they said. What is in this stuff? The main ingredient is propylene glycol. Now the makers of e-liquid will, will tell you, oh, it's just pure clean water. Well, there may be pure clean water in the chemical syrup but what it is, is really liquid chemical syrup. Propylene glycol is the actual main ingredient in antifreeze, the base ingredient of antifreeze. The second ingredient is vegetable glycerin, which is a food preservative found in small amounts in our food. Then there's nicotine of varying amounts in different artificial flavorings. If you've ever seen a theatrical smoke machine, a fog machine, maybe at a haunted house or something. This is the exact same stuff, just without the nicotine. Exact same. Now, we know it already has been linked to causing cancer. And so how can these marketers say, oh, but it's safer than cigarettes? Well, this is how. Every nicotine cigarette, tobacco cigarette, has between 3,600 and 5,000 toxic, harmful chemicals. But e-liquid has between 20 and 50 harmful toxic chemicals. That is why the marketers get away with saying it's safer. And what's interesting to me too is that when combustible, when you heat up propylene glycol, it actually turns into other chemicals. They call those emissions. And among those emissions are formaldehyde, acrolein, diacetyl, all of those have been linked to a lot of negative health effects. And of course, unfortunately, a lot of them can blow up. Picture of a poor kiddo who did. Now he's using an electronic cigarette that has a lithium ion battery, and that's the cause of a lot of the blow ups for these. But if anybody's seen the new one, the Jewel, okay, some, yes, yes. Anybody has not? Okay, let me show you a picture. Really, I'm gonna go back real quick to show you the picture. Whoops. See that one right there? That's the jewel. It's about this big. And it has no battery. It plugs into your USB drive. I actually have a few that I've had teachers give me because they confiscated them out of their kids' computers at school where it is illegal to own these things under the age of 18. The Jewel has a little pod that, is, that pulls out when it's empty and you put in another one. And the little pod has the same amount of nicotine as one entire pack of cigarettes. So does e-liquid. These bottles that have 24 to 42 milligrams have the exact same amount of nicotine as a pack of cigarettes. I had a client last year who said to me, Doc, I'm, I'm vaping three pods a day and I can't stop. Do you think I'm addicted? And it was so interesting that he was perplexed about this. Like, you know, his, his frontal lobe just couldn't compute that. 
but he was really vaping the equal amount of three packs of cigarettes. That's just incredible amount. So we know that nicotine also has a really deleterious effect on arresting brain development. And because of electronic cigarettes and vaping contraptions, now we have a new craze, which is sweeping the states where it is legal. There are very large companies who are creating hemp oil or hash oil laboratories to mass produce this. And I've had a lot of my clients over the past couple years get in big trouble because they've purchased a homemade hash oil lab at the smoke shop and tried to bring it home. Basically, if you buy a homemade lab, you'll get a big glass cylinder with a little hole in the top and an, um, a, a big hole at the bottom. You stuff that full of the green leafy marijuana and then take a butane fluid bottle and stick it on the top and have the butane coat the marijuana. What comes out at the bottom looks like these substances. This one is called dabs wax, and shatter. Then you take a teeny tiny little bit of it and put it into an electronic cigarette and vape it. This has been shown, and this is an old statistic, so I'm sure it's more, to be up to 56.4% THC potent. It's really interesting. I read a, an article that has kind of summarized different data. And they said that back in 1970, out of 100 people who smoked marijuana, about nine of them would become addicted. And if you look at alcohol, out of 100 people who drink alcohol, 16 of them will become an alcoholic. Now that number has been steady for decades. We think one of the reasons it's been steady is because we regulate the industry. We know it's an addictive substance that a lot of people use. The majority of people do not become addicted to it, but there is a minority that do. Today in our country, it was predicted that of 100 people who smoke cannabis today, 17 of them will become an addict to cannabis. For the first time in our nation's history, cannabis dependence is far reaching that of alcohol dependence and mainly in our youth. Okay, let's talk a little bit about behaviors and then we'll finish it with some solution. So we know there are a lot of different behaviors that we could potentially become addicted to because they spike dopamine levels. Doesn't everybody kind of wish that would happen for this one? <laughs> ah. So let's talk about a couple of them. So let's, let's begin with food addiction. So if you have not eaten lunch, I apologize ahead of time for this, but I want to find out if you have a mouth-watering response to this picture or this picture. So who's a carb addict? That would be me too. Who's a sugar addict? Even though they metabolize very different, right? Exactly. It's interesting, the food industry knows how dopamine spiking sugar is. So they have started putting it into foods that don't even need to be sweeter so that we'll become, I, I really don't think we have an obesity epidemic in our country. I think we have a food addiction epidemic in our country and obesity is a symptom of that epidemic. This is a picture of a person who has no eating disorder issues whatsoever after ingesting sugar. We're looking from the back forward and you can see Sugar spikes dopamine levels and it lights up the brain in various shapes or forms. This uh, show was actually done on, on ABC News and we had a, they had a food addict who had been in recovery for many years, but she decided to uh, uh, ingest sugar and have a brain picture taken so that we could see what happened in our brain and here's what happened. This is amazing to me because if you really look here, we're looking from the back forward, right? You can see that the limbic system, right, which straddles this area right here, is just lit up. Let's talk about technology addiction. This is a picture of an internet cafe 
in Asia, usually you'd see them with the lights off, very opium den-ish, packed with people. In Japan and China, there has been an infant death epi uh, syndrome and a high school dropout epidemic because so many young people are going to the internet cafe, staying there for hours and hours and hours, not going to school, and not taking care of their young infants. When I read this, I was like, no, -uh. that they're no, -uh. yes, yes. And they've been dealing with this for about 15 years longer than us, so we've got lots of literature from these uh, countries to show us. I mean, it's changing their culture. It's so interesting to me. They are putting these white lines into sidewalks because so many people will not look up from their technology and are getting into debilitating accidents and dying because of this. I know, it's so scary, isn't it? It seems very codependent to do this, doesn't it? Like we're, like we're enabling it. But then again, we need to like, protect our, our citizens. So this was a study, let's see if this, yes, done in Japan. It's a small number, but it's been replicated a lot. And I just loved the picture that they used. So they had two groups of adolescents that they studied. If you were to connect the red dots, you would see the brain connectivity of the healthy adolescent brains who only surfed the internet for a few minutes a day. This is what we want to see, lots of connections all over. Now, if you look at those purple lines, that is the area of brain connectivity of adolescents who surfed the internet for 12 or more hours a day, practically lived at an internet cafe. Now, what's interesting to me, this is a beautiful, albeit unfortunate, example of use it or lose it. Take a look at this area right here. Do you see that there's this dense connection of brain connections? And so this is the area right here that is your motor and sensory cortexes. That's the part of the brain they're using the most. Use it or lose it. But look at how many connections you see up into the prefrontal cortex area. Minimal. Ah. Again, these kiddos continue growing up and keep doing this behavior until the age of 25. That's what their brain is going to peak in. We're going to have less and less of all of those executive functioning skills. They're going to really struggle with being a parent, an employee, a friend. So briefly, let's talk about the thing nobody wants to talk about. That is pornography. So the pornography of a couple, four or five decades ago, maybe, I always think about uh, going into my garage when I was a kid and there was a stack of magazines in there and I was like mom what are those and she don't you touch those <laughs> ah. I learned later that they were playboy magazines and uh, what they were all about and that I wasn't supposed to touch them but today the pornography of today is prolific and you don't even have to check a box that says yes I'm 18 to get into an internet site and go to their search engine and search any type of video that you want to see. So what's happening is what we're calling arousal addiction. You get a dopamine spike from one video and all you have to do is click the right or left arrow key and go to the next video and this searching for a greater dopamine spike. So I read uh, one uh, theorist said that a 45-minute episode of pornography viewing can equal that of using a gram of cocaine dopamine-wise. So what you've got is this arousal addiction, this chasing of dopamine spikes more and more and more. And it is having a deleterious effect on our intimacy levels. I hope you're not offended by my graphic. This was the least offensive graphic I could find to illustrate this point, but I couldn't believe it. A, a, a few years ago, I read in some articles that the amount of erectile dysfunction being diagnosed between the ages of 18 and 26, about three or four years ago, started to surpass that amount of ED diagnosed in 65 and over. 
Now think about it. I know, doesn't it just like, oh, like these poor kids. And this is not just affecting males, it's affecting girls too that are using it, which is a population that's rising with regular use. But you know, if you think about it, sexual relationships happen here before they happen anywhere else. And so whereas in my dad's day, you had to wait a whole month before the next, you know, Playboy was published for the next dopamine spike, but today it happens so quickly that once a child is in the presence of a real life human, the dopamine spike that comes from that can't compare to the dopamine spike that comes from this. So we're seeing more and more and younger and younger kids. Parents have to monitor what is being searched at home. So here's a, a great study that illustrates video games. We'll pop on that subject for a second. We know that video games, violent video games, increase violent and aggressive behavior in kids. The good no news is that if they discontinue the violent video game use, their aggressive behavior is eliminated or decreases as well. This was a really cool brain study. As you can tell, I like those. <laughs> Done on college age students between the ages of 18 and about 25. They asked half of them not to play a video game, to take a functional MRI while they were doing this empathy test, had an empathy scenario. And they compared their brain scans to a group of guys who played Call of Duty Modern Warfare for two to four hours a day. Now Call of Duty Modern Warfare is a very violent first person shooter game. And so you can see that immediately there are differences in the prefrontal cortex region when compared to control subjects. And when you ask these guys, hey, what are you thinking? They would be able to articulate, well, I kind of have to dumb my empathy down. I can't be killing people for that many hours a day and feel empathy for them. Isn't that amazing? Like, that makes so much sense. The scary thing, use it or lose it. These guys keep going all the way up until 25, and that's where their empathy will spike because they won't have used it. Now here's the beautiful news. After this two week study was over, they had them stop, discontinue playing the game, and they came back in a couple years later, or, sorry, it came back in a couple weeks later and had uh, another study done, or brain uh, fMR, while they were taking the test, and it went back to baseline. That is how quickly the young brain can bounce back. That should give you an idea clinically of how quickly we need to act for intervention. Remember, the video game industry has been hiring addiction scientists for decades, hooking and paying teen testers up to video games and all kinds of different machines to try to indicate when dopamine spikes were had while the kids were playing the game. And when the dopamine levels spiked, as indicated by all these measures, they would record the code that kiddo just played and report that code back to the manufacturer who then puts in more of that code into their game. It is mass produced industrialized addiction from technology, video game manufacturers, the food industry, and we're just sheep doing it, buying it, not looking up from it. So if you are worried about yourself or a client or someone else, this is a really great resource called netaddiction.com. Dr. Sherry Young has been studying net addiction for a long time, and she's got a fantastic resource, really good. If you want um, specific video game interventions, uh, treatment centers, there's a really great one called Restart. Um, and so the kind of mm, uh, general rule, if you have one or two of these, ah, you may want to change your behavior. If you have three or four of these, you're gonna want to really work on intervening on this, if, especially if it's your kiddo. And if you have six or more, then you need to get help immediately and have an assessment with someone who understands process or behavioral addictions, who can tell you how to put in place a behavior modification and a treatment program that will work on these issues. Okay, the last section 
and then we'll open it up for questions. It's all about, okay, what do we do? How do you prevent and recover and heal from these things? So I always encourage parents to print this out, put it on their refrigerator. And soon at the end of summer, I'll have a book published, all fingers crossed, that will have a lot of this activity in it. So you'll be able to do this easily. But I want people to remember what the executive functioning skills are and parent toward them. So instead of using performance-based praise, what I really suggest is using brain-based praise. And so I'll tell you a cute story that illustrates this too. What you wanna do is say, to, so let me go back. These are the ones that come online in elementary school, right? They can get us up, help us remember our lunch, get us out the door, functioning in life. But starting at around age 11, 12, these executive functioning skills really start to bloom as the pruning process begins. And so what I want parents to do is instead of saying, hey, nice job, I want you to say, wow, I love how you solved that problem. Tell me how you did that. Whoa, that was a cool decision. How did you come to that? You know what, you showed me so much empathy today. It really made me happy. What were you thinking? Now, remember, there's a two-parter here, right? I am reinforcing the actual skill. My second question is reinforcing that top one. Tell me what you were thinking. Abstract conceptual understanding. Critical skill. Use it or lose it. And I'll share a cute story that illustrates the power of this. So one of my clients, this was just last year too, he comes in and he's telling me about a problem he solved. And I said, dude, that's amazing problem solving. What were you thinking? And guess what he said? What do kids say when you say, tell me what you were thinking? I don't know. They always say that. But we've got to remember, that's not real feedback, right? You should not take that as real feedback and stop asking them. Because parents do to me, they'll say that. Well, I asked and he said he didn't know. Oh, don't give up. Okay, so I said to him, all right, dude, when you figure it out, come tell me when I see you next. So he comes in for the next week's session and he didn't talk about it, but he came in two weeks later and he said, ah, oh, doc, I figured out how I solved that problem. Oh. It was beautiful and he shared with me. So that meant for two weeks, his frontal lobe was cogitating how he solved that problem. So I'm just gonna take credit for all of those neuronal connections for abstract reasoning, right? In his brain. Now, can you imagine if we did this every day at home? I mean, not annoyingly, right? Because they catch on to that. But if we use this language every day, we can help increase their deficits, but we can also really praise their strengths and watch them as they grow and blossom over time. So I wanna show you a study that illustrates, this is my last brain study, I promise, that illustrates the power of social media. A lot of kids don't make value-based decisions until they're 18, 19, 21. A lot of times kids will just engage in a behavior or not engage if they think they can get into trouble or not get into trouble. And that's pretty normal if you look at Kohlberg's stages of moral development. But it's interesting what social media is doing. So everybody probably can see that this picture depicts drunk driving. And we all know this is a bad idea. And when you show this picture to teenagers with a low amount of likes, and do a brain scan, this is what you would see. Lots of activity back here in the occipital lobe where we process visual information. Not a lot of activity in the prefrontal cortex. And if you asked these kids, what are you thinking? They would say, well, I'm not. Bad behavior, don't do it. Most even young kids will say, uh-uh, don't do that, right? Even if they later on engage in it. But look what happens when the researchers increased the amount of likes. Now what you'll see is a lot more activity, especially here. So when you ask these kiddos, okay, now what are you thinking? They're like, well, I'm looking at this picture longer to try to figure out, okay, you know, what, what changed, did anything change? Why did these people like it so much? Maybe it's not so bad after all. So I was working with a group of eighth graders 
And they said to me, I just like things to like it. You mean I shouldn't do that? Yes. <laughs> but the implications for parents, right? We got to look and see what our kids are liking. And if we see them like something that goes against our values, then we need to sit and have a talk about that and have them unlike it. So here is a nice short list of amazingly powerful prevention science tools. So this is what prevention science says works. First of all, the education has to be consistently and it can't come in a lecture. The best place to do education is the family dinner table. And there's so many things out there we can talk about. You can bring an article to the table that said, hey, did you see the CEO of Microsoft came out today and said he doesn't even give his teenagers cell phones because he knows how addictive they are. What do you think about that, right? You wanna follow the 90-10 rule. Who talks 90% of the time in the 90-10 rule? Say it louder. The kids. Yes, I got a therapist in the front row who knows this rule. What does it usually end up being? Right, we end up lecturing and then we're talking more. So this is when I suggest we use a very powerful therapeutic tool called duct tape therapy. <laughs> you just imagine, right? You ask them the question and let their executive functioning skills go, right? At dinner, what do you think? Provoke them a little bit with a provocative question. Do you think that I should not give you technology just like he doesn't get, oh, that'll get a conversation started. Do not argue. Use duct tape therapy. Remember, you're just shaping neuronal connections for com abstract conceptual understanding. They don't have to make a whole lot of sense right away. They don't, right? They're more irrational until they grow rational connections. Then, oh, I want to tell you, there was some beautiful research done on family dinners. The Center for Addiction and Substance Abuse actually looked at this amazing body of research that showed as family dinners decrease, especially in high school, high-risk behavior incrementally increases. There's a whole website called the Family Dinner Project, which helps people celebrate Family Dinner Day and gives them the information of how important this is. And even if you don't talk about prevention stuff, kids will say, who have a lot of family dinners, I don't want to show up with bloodshot eyes. I don't want you know, to have to talk to my parents about this at family dinner, because they'll make me. You know, so they engage in a lot less behavior. And so even if we get really plugged into life and life gets busy, we gotta keep those family dinner times and so if you are a social worker or a therapist, something that you can do immediately is help your families by instituting more family dinners and you will see high risk behavior immediately start to decrease. Then have a family code. So when I say family code, what I mean is a really simple code. I like to do the family code project with elementary school parents or middle school parents where you have the whole family sit around either in a session or at home and you have them create their family code. It's just a really short list of rules. Short is the operative. In the Collier family, the Collier family code is we treat others with kindness, compassion, and respect on and offline. We do not use drugs ever, and we only drink alcohol when we're 21 or older. That's the code. So a lot of, I've had families like do a poster project or this one dad did a coat of arms and then they printed it off and hung it on the wall. And that way at the family dinner, you can say, oh, well, that wouldn't happen in our family because our family code is what? Our family code is this. What research shows is that it creates unity. Kids want to follow it because it creates unity. The biggest mistake that I see parents make is they fail to talk about high risk behavior, right? They deal with it after the fact. When if you are proactive, it can prevent so much behavior because kids want to follow our rules even when they don't want to follow our rules. And if you have a lot of family dinner and you, you name the code, especially like in high risk situations, right? Your middle schooler goes off to a sleepover, which is a high risk situation today because we don't know what technology they'll be exposed to, right? 
We don't know what brothers and sisters of that family are gonna try on our little, you know, our middle schoolers. So they're walking out the door and you say, hey, have a good time, remember the family code? What's the family code? Oh, mom, the family code is blah, 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 blah. Oh, I love your memory skills. <laughs> Make good decisions, bye. If you do that every couple weeks, every three, four weeks maybe, not all the time, they memorize it, when they get out into the world and they, they will engage in high risk behavior, but a lot less than they would have. And they will remember, oh, can't do that. Our family code is. They did a longitudinal study, 16, over 16,000 people over a, a long period of time. And they figured out why the kids who did not engage in high risk behavior or did engage and then stopped quickly, they asked them why. The number one answer, my mom would kick my butt. That kid knows the code. Give consequences. And here's what we recommend immediately. Parents think, oh, well, I did it in high school. It's just a phase. Don't do it again. Slap on the hand. That gets translated by the adolescent brain is my parents don't care. So make sure that you give them a big consequence right away. And we recommend that their life is completely miserable, no tech, no friends, no nothing, for at least two weeks. And with the caveat that if they do it again, that will double or triple. But parents say, but I'm worried that they won't call me when they make a bad choice. So this is how you get around that. You say to your child, okay, look, if you tell me, then your consequence will be minimal, maybe less than half. You're gonna get one, because you went against the code, but it will be minimal. But if I find out from anybody else but you that you've engaged in something that goes against the code, then your consequence will double or triple. So it could be here if you come tell me, or it could be here if I find out from others. And then if it happens again, get help. Seek help. I can't tell you how many assessments that I've done with kids in my 20 year span that I've never seen again. Because that one meeting with Dr. Collier at that place for two and a half hours did it. I will never do that again. Oh, great. <laughs> okay, my last slide. So I did my dissertation on a prevention program that I had the opportunity to create. And uh, we focused on 15 different high-risk behaviors because we know dopamine is dopamine is dopamine, no matter where it comes from. And I uh, did a four-year study on a school where I tracked these behaviors over time that we focused in on our prevention program. And then at the very last year, I randomly selected a group of students who'd been there for the four years. And I asked them, I showed them this list, and I said, tell me which behaviors you have engaged in and which ones you haven't, and I wanna know why you did and why you didn't. Completely anonymous. It was amazing. Those, uh, we saw a, a statistical decrease in seven out of 15 of these each year we were there. And the last year, it was amazing because the numbers looked like other schools out there, except statistically significantly lower. Because there's always gonna be kids who engage in it. But this one kid, this one student, very tall, athlete, African-American boy, he's telling me, he goes through the list, and he's like, no, 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 no. Oh, yes. No, 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 no. One out of 15. The first one is alcohol. And I said, dude, you mean you're a senior, and you have not drank. You're even an athlete, more common in student athletes. You're even an athlete, and you didn't use. How? He said, well, you know what? Since I was in elementary school, my parents and I have always had family dinners together. And at those family dinners, they've always talked to me about this stuff. Like they would bring articles from the National Geographic, or they would talk like, hey, did you hear that story in the news about the kid who got in trouble? They would always, and we'd have these really great discussions about it. And then they would always tell me, that's not what we do in our family. He just illustrated all of those prevention techniques. I wanted to go, hug and kiss his parents, you know? <laughs> and they don't even know, you know? They just, it just happened for them. It was really beautiful. And so the one behavior, he said, that my parents didn't talk to me about 
Guess which one? Porn. Porn. He said, that's the one thing they didn't tell me about. And one day I was just online and it popped up and I clicked. And he said, I feel a lot of shame because I look at it weekly. To me, that was um, a beautiful and a sad kind of illustration of the power of these techniques when they're used and when they're not used. We have to teach our children how dopamine affects their brain to potentially save them of a lifetime of struggling with an addiction as an adult.